The story you are about to hear is a compilation of documented true facts featuring historical characters, events, or places that has played a role in shaping history. Please sit back and listen as I recite this narrative for you. Between 1935 and 1938, a serial killer murdered and dismembered at least 12 victims, only two of which were ever positively identified. Even during the worst economic downturn in modern American history during the 1930s, Cleveland was a city on the rise. The population continued to grow and became a melting pot of laborers needed to support the economically powerful steel and manufacturing base. Millionaire's Row was in its heyday. The Great Lakes Exposition and the Republican National Convention were slated for 1936, as were many other conferences and conventions. Despite the effects of the Great Depression, people were beginning to get on their feet again. The Cleveland Torso murderer remains unidentified to this day and has been linked to up to 20 murders between 1935 and 1938. There are at least 12 victims officially attributed to the work of the serial killer and each had been dismembered. Those that worked on the Cleveland Torso murderer case believe that there are other murders he may be responsible for, including some from the 1920s and the 1950s. The serial killer tended to target drifters, and as such, some of the victims have never been identified. There was no preference for gender, and he murdered both men and women. At that time in Cleveland, it was the Depression era, and his victims all appeared to come from the lower classes of society. Each victim was beheaded, and in some cases, the torso was cut in half, which led to the moniker, the Cleveland Torso Murderer. The majority of the male victims had their genitals removed, and some victims displayed evidence of some sort of chemical treatment on their body. Most were discovered long after their deaths, and the advanced level of decomposition also made it difficult to identify the bodies. To add to the difficulty, many of the heads were never located. On September 1934, a young man finds the lower half of a woman's torso, thighs still attached but amputated at the knees, washed up on the shores of Lake Erie just east of Brathanil. Cuyahoga County Coroner A.J. Pierce noted some sort of chemical preservative on the skin which had turned it red, tough, and leathery. The subsequent search yielded only a few other body parts. The body was that of a female in her mid-thirties. The head was never found. The woman was never identified. She is only referred to as the Lady of the Lake. It wasn't until two years later that this find was included in the official killing total and thus became known as Victim Zero. It would be another year before the case began officially, and then it would be another part of the city, the now infamous Kingsbury Run. On September 1935, two teenage boys discovered a decapitated, emasculated corpse of a white male at the base of Jackass Hill, where East 49th Street dead ends into Kingsbury Run. He had been decapitated and his genitals removed. The body, naked save for a pair of socks, was clean and drained of blood. There were rope burns around both wrists. It was estimated that he had been dead for two or three days. Fingerprints identified this victim as Edward Andrassy, a 28-year-old white male. Andrassy had an arrest record, was rumored to be a homosexual, and frequented the Roaring Third. Police discovered a second body nearby, also decapitated and emasculated. It appeared to be covered with the same chemical preservative as the Lady of the Lake. This body apparently had been dead for three or four weeks. The 40-year-old white male was never identified. On January 1936, a woman discovers about half the body of a female neatly wrapped in newspaper and packed in two half-bushel baskets. 
The baskets were left alongside the Hart Manufacturing Building on Central Avenue near East 20th Street. Everything except the head was recovered about 10 days later in a vacant lot on nearby Orange Avenue. As in the case of Edward Andresi, the cause of death had been decapitation. For some reason, however, the killer had waited for rigor mortis to set in before disarticulating the rest of the body. Fingerprints again would allow the identification of one Florence Genevieve Polillo, waitress, barmaid, and prostitute. At the time of her death, she resided at East 32nd Street and Carnegie, right on the edge of the Roaring Third. On June 1936, early one morning in Kingsbury Run, two young boys discovered the head of a white male wrapped in a pair of trousers close to the East 50 Feet Street Bridge. It was believed he had still been alive when his head was cut off his body. His head was found and he had been dead for around two days when he was discovered. Police found the body of the 20-some-year-old man the next day dumped in front of the Nickel Plate Railroad Police Building. Clean and drained of blood, the corpse was intact except for the head. Pierce again determined the death had been caused by decapitation. In spite of a fresh set of fingerprints and the presence of six distinctive tattoos on various parts of the body, police were never able to identify the victim. A plaster reproduction of the man's head, along with a diagram of the kind and location of the tattoos, were made to display at the Great Lakes Exposition of 1936. More than 100,000 people saw the death mask and tattoo chart. The tattooed man was never identified. On July 1936, a teenage girl came across the decapitated remains of a 40-year-old white male while walking through the woods near Clinton Road and Big Creek on the near west side. The victim had been dead about two months and his head, as well as a pile of bloody clothing, was found nearby. Judging by the enormous quantity of blood that had seeped into the ground, this man had apparently been killed where his body was found. On September 10, 1936, a transient trips over the upper half of a man's torso while trying to hop a train at East 37th Street in Kingsbury Run. Police searched a nearby pool, which was nothing more than a big open sewer, and found the lower half of the torso and part of both legs. Police sent a diver in to make the recovery. The number of onlookers that turned out to watch the grim spectacle was estimated at over 600 and the killer may well have been among them. Victim number 6 was in his late 20s and the cause of death, yet again, was decapitation. Coroner Pierce noted that the lack of hesitation marks in the disarticulation of the body indicated a strong confident killer, very familiar with the human anatomy. The head had been cut off with one bold clean stroke. The victim died instantly. Identification was never made. Giving in to the mounting pressure from Mayor Harold Burton, recently appointed safety director Elliot Ness gets more involved in the case. Coroner Pierce calls for what the newspaper dubbed a torso clinic. A meeting of the police, the coroner, and other experts to discuss information and to profile someone who could be responsible for these gruesome killings. The police department put detectives Peter Marilou and Martin Zelowski on the case full-time. They moved deftly through the seedy underworld that constitutes the run and the Roaring Third, often dressing the part, often on their own time. By the time the case had run its course, the two had interviewed more than 1,500 people, the department as a whole more than 5,000. This would be the biggest police investigation in Cleveland history. The November elections returned Harold Burton as mayor but Coroner Pierce is replaced by the young Democrat and now legendary Sam Gerber. Gerber's fierce dedication to medicine, along with his degree in law, put him at the forefront of the investigation. On September 10, 1936, half of a male torso was found in Kingsbury Run. This victim was unidentified and there was nothing attached to the torso below the hips. His head was never located and he had been dead for about two days. The next body missing its head was found on February 23, 1937. A man finds the upper half of a woman's torso washed up on shore east of Brathenau. Unlike all previous victims, the cause of death had not been decapitation. This had happened after she was already dead. 
the lower half of the torso washed ashore three months later at about East 30th Street. The woman was in her mid-twenties. She was never identified. A teenage boy discovered a human skull on June 6, 1937 underneath the Lorraine Carnegie Bridge. Next to it was a burlap bag containing the skeletal remains of what turned out to be a petite black woman about 40 years old. Dental work allowed for the unofficial identification of one Rose Wallace of Scoville Avenue. Police followed every lead they had on her. They led nowhere. The head had been removed along with a rib. This victim had been dead about a year. The body of an unidentified male was found on July 6, 1937 in the Cuyahoga River. A young guardsman standing watch by the West 3rd Street Bridge saw the first piece of victim 9 in the wake of a passing tugboat. Over the next few days, police recovered the entire body except for the head from the waters of the Cuyahoga River. The abdomen had been gutted and the heart ripped out, clearly indicating a new element of viciousness in the killer's approach. The victim was in his mid to late 30s. He was never identified. On April 1938, a young laborer on his way to work in the flats saw what he at first thought was a dead fish along the banks of the Cuyahoga River. Closer inspection revealed it to be the lower half of a woman's leg, the first piece of victim 10. A month later, police pulled two burlap bags out of the river containing both parts of the torso and most of the rest of both legs. For the first time, Coroner Gerber detected drugs in the system. Were the drugs used to immobilize the victim or was she an addict? The answer might come when they found the arms. They never did. She was never identified. On August 16, 1938, three scrap collectors foraging in a dump site at East 9th and Lakeside found a torso of a woman wrapped in a man's double-breasted blue blazer and then wrapped again in an old quilt. The legs and arms were discovered in a recently constructed makeshift box wrapped in brown butcher paper and held together with rubber bands. The head had been similarly wrapped. Gerber noted that some of the parts looked as if they had been refrigerated. While searching for more pieces, the police discovered the remains of a second body only yards away. These two bodies had been placed in a location that was in plain view from Elliot Ness's office window almost as if taunting him. Both victims 11 and 12 were never identified. A Cleveland resident, Frank Dolezal, was arrested on August 24, 1939, under suspicion of being responsible for the death of Florence Polillo. Six weeks after he was arrested, however, Dolezal died in prison. He was found to have six broken ribs, which were in present before he was arrested. Although he had admitted at one point to killing Florence in self-defense, it is generally believed that he wasn't responsible for her murder or any others. Another potential suspect was Dr. Francis E. Sweeney, a World War I veteran who had extensive experience with amputations in the field during the war. Sweeney was interviewed by Elliot Ness, the Cleveland safety director at the time, and was given two polygraph examinations, both of which he failed. Sweeney committed himself to a mental hospital and there was no further evidence to suggest he was the killer. Hey everyone, I just wanted to express how grateful I am that you took the time to listen to my narration. Hopefully you enjoyed it. I am Twisted Mind and please enjoy the rest of your day. Salamat. Thank you for taking the time and joining me for the past couple of premieres. Greenwork Stories, Miss Cafe Latte, Eriza Miguel, Tez Atienza, Jasper Reed Stories, Eliseo Saavedra, Ms. Colette, Abigail Sofia, Ben Jose, John Den Rosales, Unicorn Blood Version 2, Aubrey Delgado. And thank you also for taking the time to comment to Eriza Miguel, Tez Atienza, Ms. Colette, Unicorn Blood Version 2, iMusic Mix TV, Aubrey Delgado, Pinoy Sad Love Stories TV, Tiktilaok Stories, and Jasper Reed Stories. As always, I appreciate each and every single one of you for dropping by and listening to my uploads. Blessed be.